all right, so first time DUI, and Kim has an app. I want you to talk about the app first, and then we'll talk about the steps of a DUI and what's happening. But tell us about the app you have. Yes, my law firm has an app that works for Android products or Apple products. You download it from either store, depending on what product you have, and it's called I Got Stopped. And it's an app that allows you to, um, you can uh, record your entire encounter with law enforcement. It gives you some information about your rights as well, generally. Um, there's a, the, my favorite thing about it is you as a parent will get this. Yeah. You have the ability to send a text message pinging your location that has an automatic message to your mom, potentially, or your spouse, if, depending on yeah. what's appropriate for you for your yeah. emergency contact. And it pings your location and it automatically says, wow. I've been pulled over by law enforcement. Yeah. And then you can record the encounter and email it. It's all set up in the app that you can email it to us. Is it specific to Missouri? It is specific to Missouri. That makes sense. Okay. Yes. All right. So first thing, download the app. <laughs> but if you're getting to this video later in, the, um, in where you have gotten a DWI, Kim, I want you to talk about when somebody is stopped in the state of Missouri and it's under a suspicion of DWI, DUI, what should they be doing? And I know it's different. It kind of depends if you've been pulled over before, if you've had convictions before. I'm talking about somebody that has never had any contact with law enforcement about alcohol-related stuff. Boy, and unfortunately, that's such a big question because it truly depends so much on where you are within the state if you're being pulled over by a police officer of a, a city agency, the police department, or the sheriff's department, or the highway patrol, and the county you're in matters. Um, so there are so many, it, it's so difficult to answer that question simply. The simple thing used to be in the old days, you would tell people just don't blow. That's not the case anymore. Okay. If it's your first offense in Jackson County, and you believe you're gonna blow above a .08, Chances are you should not blow because we can save your driver's license in certain counties, Jackson County being one of them that has something called a diversion program for your license, which you have to plead guilty to the criminal case. Often, and then there's other counties all around Kansas City that don't have a diversion program. So that rule that might apply in Jackson on a first time offender does not apply in Cass, Lafayette, Johnson County, Missouri. Um, and so it's not necessarily the thing you should do. It does apply in Clay County, similar to Jackson County. Um, the, the problem is, is that I have had four people call me in the middle of the night and I've asked them about 30 questions. And after, at the end of it, I've advised every single one of them to blow and every single one of them blew under 0.08. Had they not called me and reached me and assessed the situation, they'd have been arrested, had a DWI, nothing we could do. Gotcha. Okay. And those four people had no charges. Right. Okay. That's, that's huge. Okay. So the answer is it depends. Oh, unfortunately, <laughs> that's the answer. It depends. Okay. So well, why don't you walk through what would happen? And this is a non-checkpoint related stop. This is somebody, uh, a police officer or a highway patrol sheriff has stopped somebody under suspicion of DWI. What, what are, what's going to happen during that whole entire encounter? Well, obviously just like any traffic ticket, the first experience is going to be that off the officer uh, turns on his lights, potentially turns on a siren, and you need to pull over. And they're paying very close attention to how you pull over, how fast you pull over. Are you using your blinker? Are you pulling up to the curb? Are you hitting the curb? Um, they're paying attention to how you stop, how you're driving, not just the, in, the reason they saw you in the first place, which could be non-moving violation. It could have been that your taillight was out or the light above your license plate was out. Gives them valid reason to pull you over. So they're paying attention to how you're driving. Then they come to your window and they'll ask for your license and your insurance. They're paying attention to how you respond, how you smell. They're smelling you immediately, depending on the time of day, the minute your window's rolled down. Um, well, they're smelling you no matter what, but the time right. of day is the thing that kind of makes them a little- 2 a.m. 2 a.m. Versus and they're potentially watching a bar that they're allowed to do, even though no one in the public realizes that's perfectly lawful. They can totally do that and watch bars. Um, and so they're paying attention to everything you say, how you say it, are you slurring your words, how difficult it is for you to find your insurance and your driver's license. And they're noting everything. 
and everything's on video in most jurisdictions. Most jurisdictions have a dash camera from the vehicle that's paying, that's watching everything. Sound is not always good, but the visual at least is almost always in every single case there. Um, a lot of agencies now have body cams too, so their sound is good, they're right up on you, and we can see exactly how law enforcement handled the encounter, and that's often, frankly, the videos is how often we are able to win cases. Um, but your experience is going to be, that's how it starts out. And then if they smell alcohol, they're gonna start saying, where are you coming from, where are you going, which is normal in all traffic cases, and which you don't have to answer, but most people do, um, because you have no obligation to speak to law enforcement other than your driver's license and your insurance under any circumstance. But you do um, often get asked, well, how much have you had to drink? I smell alcohol. And so people start talking and saying, well, I've had a couple. I was at the Chiefs game or I was at my friend's house, whatever. The, their story is they, um, that causes law enforcement to then bring them out of the vehicle. Okay. From that moment forward, it's a completely different encounter than okay. a normal traffic ticket stop. All right, I'm just going to pause you right there and just say that I think it's a normal reaction, and I tell this to my clients to answer their questions. It's You want to um, be a courteous person, and right. you know, especially here in the Midwest, we're so nice, and uh, they're, they're interacting with you and you want to, but I cannot stress enough that... Sh she is correct. You do not have to answer those questions. You are not obligated to answer those questions. Right. Um, but it's difficult not to. Of course. I answer those questions when I've been pulled over. Yes. Well, and you also want to, anyway, yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So out of the car. They're out of the car. Once they get you out of the car, they're paying attention to everything. Did you remove your seatbelt or did you struggle to get out of your car? Did you put your hand on the door to help lift yourself up? Everything you're doing, they're watching. And if you're having any difficulties like um, holding on to the car as you're walking to the back of it, which is where they're going to take you, to the back of your vehicle, okay. to the front of their vehicle in that space where the camera has a clear, good picture, and hopefully the sound is working a little better because the officer's wearing the mic. Okay. Um, and so they're paying attention to everything you do. If you're having difficulty walking and it's because you just had knee surgery, I advise people to start talking about that. Start talking about what's going on with you. If right. you have Meniere's disease, which is an equilibrium problem that causes dizziness and makes people often not walk straight, talk about that. Start right. talking about what's going on with you to okay. explain um, why you're not necessarily balanced and walking straight because they're yeah. watching for that. Yeah. Unfortunately, if you also are intoxicated and you're slurring your words, Everything you say is, if you're slurring, is going to be used against you. But I cannot tell you how many times we win cases because the officer puts in the police report, which looks really bad, slurred words, stumbling, uh, bad balance, and all this information that when you get the video, it doesn't really. match the report at all. Right. Right. So the video can be very helpful. Yeah. Okay. And so when they're, they're taken to the car, in between the cars, yes. that is when they're going to do the field sobriety test. Every officer is trained according to the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, NHTSA is what we call it. Uh, they're trained all across the country exactly the same, to do every single test the same because these tests are not supposed to be considered valid or you're not supposed to be judged on these tests if the officer doesn't do them accurately. There's three standardized field sobriety tests. Your horizontal gaze nystagmus, which is the one where they're taking a pen or their finger and looking at your eyes. And I often have people say, well, I passed that test. <laughs> you have no idea if you passed that test because yeah. it's about the involuntary jerking of your eyeball. You have no control over it. Right. There's over 40 causes of nystagmus in your eyes and officers can not tell what kind you have. They can just report that they saw it. And in addition, some people naturally have nystagmus. One time a highway patrolman, we were in court, and I said, what is this nystagmus and what does it look like? And he tested me, because I said, I have astigmatism, I'm farsighted, right. I've been wearing bifocals since I was three. Yeah. I, I'm sure I have nystagmus, and he said, you do. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so some people have it naturally. Um, but there's two more tests after that have to do with walk and turn okay. and a one leg stand. Okay. And they're testing you on, are you listening to their instructions? Are you following their instructions? And then how do you do on the test? And they don't tell you all the rules of the test. So I often have people tell me, oh, I passed those tests. Right. And again, it's really hard to know if you passed the test. Okay. So if they just deem that you have not passed the test, the next step is? There's other things that can sometimes happen. Okay. Um, before they got you out of the vehicle, their training teaches them. They could do a couple things to see if they even should get you out of the vehicle. Okay. Most officers 
that seem to blow their training and now do those tests, which are the alphabet test and the numbers test. Okay. And I've had people from other countries, English is not their first language, say sure. no. Yeah. Um, but alphabet, they'll pick a letter okay. in the middle somewhere to start and then another letter to finish. So if you have any difficulties with that at all, which a lot of people do, right. it's not as simple as saying A to Z. Yeah. Um, or numbers, some numbers backwards. Yeah, They're testing you. You don't have to do these tests either. But um, officers will often do that at the end, even though they're training, because they're supposed to do it to determine if they're even bringing you out of the car at all. Okay. And then there's the preliminary breath test, which is this portable device that typically is not calibrated. No maintenance is done on it. Right. And they um, keep it in the back of their car, even though the operator's manual talks about how it cannot be in any... Um, it cannot be below a certain temperature or right. above a certain temperature right. where it's messing with the mechanics of this. It's a machine. It's yeah. like leaving your iPad or your cell phone in the right. car. It can blow the circuits, so to speak. Sure. But most officers don't follow the rules and don't even read the operator's manual. So I don't ever recommend taking the preliminary breath test either. But okay. You don't have to take any of these tests. I just announced. Right. Okay. Okay. You, can, you have the right to refuse everything. They still have the right to arrest you, unfortunately. Now, that, 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 that was going to be my next question. So they... Um, even if you said, okay, I'm going to give you my name and my insurance card or my driver's license and my insurance card, mm -hmm. and I'm not participating in anything else, mm -hmm. um, they still have, they still can arrest you and take you to jail. And then well, we're going to talk about the jail or the arrest part later and what you're doing at the station, mm -hmm. but that is still possible. It is. Okay. But you haven't given them any evidence. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have the choice to give them the evidence against you, or if you're lucky, they've uh, chances are they're going to arrest you anyway. Once they brought you out of the vehicle, I don't, I've never ever in 25 years had a person say, "Well, they brought me out of the vehicle and they did all the testing and then they let me go." They 99.9% yes. .9 of the time are going to arrest yes. you anyway. Yes. So you might as well not give them evidence against you. Yeah. But sometimes those videos are the 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 the, the diamond in the rough, so to speak, right. in the sense that. The police report will say my client did certain things right. that the video shows not true. And the officer, when they lose credibility, right, because they're not telling the truth or no, they're not telling the whole story, which is all the signs of your sobriety, which they almost never do in the report, but the video will show that. Right. Then th th that's how we can win cases. That's yep. how we get so many dismissals or we win at trial or we, um, you know, talk to the prosecutor and maybe it's an amendment off of a DWI to yep. something else, okay. which I highly recommend you fight your first DWI. Right. Because right. the consequences are so severe. It affects everything later on. Absolutely. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Your present and your future. Yes, exactly. Okay. So they have, a, they arrested you, taken you to the station. Yeah. What is going to happen there? At the station? Well, sometime before you get to the station or at the station. They're going to read you what's called the Implied Consent Law in Missouri, okay. which is a script they're reading off a form. They're required to read it verbatim or substantially verbatim. Okay. And it basically tells you you're under arrest uh, for the suspicion of driving while intoxicated. I want to take your blood, breath, or urine. And in Missouri, they're allowed to ask for two. So if you say no, to, if they ask for breath and you say yes and you blew a zero, 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 they're going to ask you for blood. And then if you say no, that's a refusal. Okay. So if they ask you for breath and it's above a 0.08, they'll usually quit there. Um, they can take your blood if they want to, but they usually don't ask for the second test unless the breath test for some reason fails. I had a case once where the breath machine, there had been some um, electrical difficulties in the building that okay. had affected the breath oh, test sure. machine. They okay. ended up asking for blood and the person was like, no, you can't put a needle in me. Yeah. Uh, where's the machine for me right. to blow it? <laughs> and that was deemed a refusal. You don't have the right to say I have a problem with needles. Oh, It's very challenging. Wow. I mean, you can, you have the right to say no, but then they just um, either give you, well, they give you a refusal case and take your license for a year potentially, unless you have an attorney who knows how to fight and win those cases. Um, or they will go ask a judge for a search warrant and take your blood against your will. Right. Wow. Um, so that is at the beginning, the implied consent. Yes. And so then whether or not you have agreed or said no, that's when it either, it goes further. They will, they will then set up the equipment and yeah. um, they have to wait 15 minutes before they can allow you to blow into the breathalyzer because they're required by the, their steps and their rules to okay. wait 15 minutes to, 
pay attention to you to make sure you're not vomiting, you're not ingesting anything at all. Okay. And so some of the cases I won, it's because the officer failed to make sure there was no gum or chewing tobacco. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but so they're supposed to make sure the mouth alcohol is gone. Okay. That's the thing they're supposed to prevent. Okay. All right. So waiting 15 minutes should, scientifically, they say that your mouth alcohol will uh, be gone by then. And then you blow into the breathalyzer. Okay. And I've had some people have difficulty. Right. I, I know that uh, clients who've had lung disease or emphysema have tried to say, I'm having difficulty with this it's because I have emphysema or I have lung disease. Right. And so sure. it's not necessarily easy to blow into that. It's mm -hmm. much like blowing into a balloon and some people feel like they're going to pass out. Right. Um, but it's, uh, that, that's the process that they'll take you through for okay. the breath test. Okay. Um, so then if they're, okay, so they, they see they've taken the test or refused the test. Mm -hmm. And at that point is the, is the stop over or is there something further that goes on with the, with the traffic stop? Well, most of that experience is at the station. That's what I mean. Yeah, I yes. mean at the station. Yes. Most of that experience is. There are some jurisdictions that have a preliminary breath test hooked up. It's called the Alpha Sensor 4, hooked up to a printer mm -hmm. in a vehicle. Kansas yes. City has this. Wow. And they can um, give you the breath test at the scene and never take you to the station. If you pass it, chances are they're going to let you go home. If you fail it, uh, chances of taking you to the station and putting you in jail. But okay. I've had people be arrested and charged with DWI below 0.08, which is very frustrating. Yes. Doesn't mean we can't win the case. We right. have 100% of those times, but it has happened. Sure. Okay. What's the justification? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think the officers just think, well, I think you're intoxicated. I don't care what the number shows. Okay. Maybe they know the machine is not infallible. Reliable, yeah. The machine is not infallible. Yeah. And maybe they're concerned. Somebody has put, put pressure on them about liability, putting you back out on the street. I don't know. Okay. Otherwise, it happens, shockingly. Sure. sure. If somebody has... Um, gotten or what what kind of paperwork are you walking out once somebody's posted bond for you or you're allowed to leave what kind of paperwork are you leaving the station with you should be leaving with the tickets for all the traffic violations that the officer thought he saw including the dwi itself or dui um not always though those can come right. in the mail later yep. those can be if you have priors those can be charges filed by the state as felonies okay in your future yep Six months down the road, you get arrested on a felony. Right. Um, but typically, you're leaving with tickets. You're also should, you should be leaving with a bond paper if they made you post bond with a court date on it. Some places do make you post bond still. Other places don't. And okay. So I'm getting less and less that we see people, especially in a first or second offense, having to pay money to get out of jail. Right. Um, that's less and less now. Okay. But it still happens in Missouri. Um, and then the other paper you should leave with is the paper that tells you about your driver's license. Okay. Like you have so little time to do something about your driver's license that you need to call a lawyer immediately. Okay. And someone who knows DWI, okay. not just any lawyer. That's right. All right. So let's, let's get into when you have received a DWI, that turns into two cases. I tell people yes, it, it turns into a case that or has, three. Oh gosh. Well, <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. You okay. take the breath test. Right. Uh, or I'm sorry, you refused the breath test. Right. They got a search warrant and took your blood. Okay. And yeah. it was above a point of weight. Okay. Yeah. So there's all, but for the most part, it's two. For the okay. most part, it's two. <laughs> That's right. It turns into the criminal case. I'm going to call it criminal, um, which are the tickets and or indictments information. Okay. Yes. And that has to do with, um, you know, the court of law and getting the actual DUI itself. The then, right. The criminal case is where you could go to jail. You yep. could get probation. You could have to do community service. You could have to pay fines. That's all the criminal side that a lot of people don't like to call it criminal because they don't feel like they've right. committed a crime, but yep. technically you've been accused of a crime. Yes. Okay. So that's the criminal side, but then the civil side has to do with your driver's license and that's your right. driving privilege. That's right. And I feel like is almost as important I mean, as the criminal side, because it has to do with the, if you can operate a motor vehicle, you know, without restrictions in the state of Missouri. Right. And it is a big deal and it has time limits on it. And right. that's why you got to get to 
Kim or another lawyer very quickly to determine what the path forward is with having to do with the criminal case and having to do with the civil case, but mainly because the civil case is the time is ticking right then and there. Immediately your time is ticking.